All right, back on the conversation. Our next guest is trying to give you a race. No, really, he is. Uh, you're gonna see how Joe Sandberg joins us. He's a business leader, entrepreneur, and anti-poverty advocate. He's one of the original investors in Blue Apron, uh, and he's the co-founder of Aspiration, Aspiration or founder. Uh, Joe, welcome back. Thanks for having me. No problem. So, Joe, um, you're uh, basically uh, initiating uh, an $18 minimum wage ballot measure in California. Um, that actually takes a lot of money to put together. Uh, so, why? Why are you doing that? Well, I believe that everyone who works full time should be able to afford life's basic needs. And right now in California, there are almost 10 million people who are working full time who can't afford life's basic needs. As we've discussed many times in the past, if the minimum wage had increased at the rate of productivity since 1960, it would be $24 right now. We're going to make it 18 because we can win 18. It's a compromise as it is. 18 is better than 15. And it will mean a raise of $6,240 per year or $24 per day for five and a half million plus Californians. And that's going to be the difference between a lot of Californians providing three or two meals a day for their kids, being able to make rent, being able to provide fresh clothes during the wintertime for their kids. So it's, it's a big deal. It's not enough, but it's a step in the right direction toward ending poverty in California. Okay, um, we covered this on the show and $6,240 raise is a pretty big deal for people in California. And we explained, hey, it also pushes everybody's wages up. And it affects the nation when you California uh, goes to a higher minimum wage. So that people know that. Uh, but of course, the question you'll get most often is, but Joe, doesn't it hurt business interests, the poor companies here that you're affecting? When you put more pockets in the money, more money in the pockets of consumers, it's great for business. We have a consumer economy. And when people who need to buy things have more money, then businesses sell more goods and services and have to hire more workers, which increases wages even further. So, you know, you don't need to have a PhD in economics to understand that when your economy is based on consumption and you put more money in the pockets of those who have to buy things, everyone's better off, including businesses. Yeah, Henry Ford came out with that a long time ago. Uh, and yeah. but but to be fair, between 1938 and 1968. Wages did keep up with productivity. And did America really have a good economy back then? Uh, better than it is now, certainly less, um, less unequal. Since 1968, it's really been a clear trend. Economic growth has been taken by the rich and giant corporations and everyone else has enjoyed a shrinking and shrinking piece of the pie. And where that hurts um, people the worst are people who don't come to the table with any wealth. and. People of color and women in particular are disproportionately earning a minimum wage. And what's really cool about raising the minimum wage is that you're putting more money, especially in the pockets of working women and, and people of color. So look, I, I uh, always give the disclaimer that Aspiration is uh, a sponsor of TYT. But the reason you guys- What's Aspiration? Are, <laughs> uh, the reason why you guys are is because you're actually progressive. And we don't take uh, non-progressive uh, sponsors like you guys. So uh, and and so then it leads me to the question: Yes, but are you living by the same mantra? Like, for example, what's the minimum wage at Aspiration? At Aspiration, the minimum wage is twenty-five bucks. Okay, fine. Uh, <laughs> okay, and I knew that, uh, but <laughs> but that's definitely living by it. Um, now, look, uh, in in all seriousness, uh, the the right wing is going to come at you big time on this. Because uh, there's a ballot measure. Ballot measures are very expensive. You're financing one side of it. Um, almost all the other companies will finance the other side of it. And one of the things they'll say is, "Oh no, no, we're trying to help the workers, Joe, because you know if you pass this ballot measure, it's going to cost a lot of jobs. That'll be their number one fear mongering tactic." So how do you answer that? Well, one of the reasons I'm optimistic we're going to win this is that. The counter argument against the minimum wage is, is old and stale and, and ought to be really discarded into the dustpan of bad ideas. Here's the evidence for that. A statewide minimum wage ballot initiative hasn't lost anywhere in the United States in over 30 years. 14 consecutive minimum wage ballot initiatives have passed around the country in states that are blue, but also states that are purple and red. We don't need to look farther back in time than November of 20 
when a $15 minimum wage passed in Florida with almost 62% of the vote. President Biden's campaign team was reluctant to embrace the $15 minimum wage initiative in Florida. And the result was actually that it ran 14 points ahead of Biden in Florida. This is a very popular issue with broad support across the ideological spectrum because this idea that people who work should not live in poverty is actually a pretty uncontroversial idea with the exception of like the most extreme, you know, misanthropic people out there. So well, there might be some lobbyists that represent a small number of businesses that have some ulterior motives to stop this. Most small businesses, most entrepreneurs and, and most voters are for a higher minimum wage. So there'll be a lot of money spent against it, but I think it's gonna be money that's kind of vaporized. I think we're gonna win. And I think when it's all said and done, it won't be that close of a margin. Yeah, well, it, it isn't in any of the states. So you know, I, I, we push for a higher minimum wage here at TYT. You do it and you back it up with, with you know actual money to get it on the ballot. That's super important. Obviously, Reverend William Barber is a great champion uh, in the country for higher minimum wage. Well, but we have to do it as ballot measures because we can't get politicians to do it. So I want to come back to in a second, but to give people a sense of how right Joe is about the red states. Um, while Claire McCaskill lost her election, a ballot measure raising the minimum wage in Missouri won by 62% easily, right? In Arkansas, it passed with 68%. So that's why ballot measures are really, really effective. That's why people are worried about them. Uh, and so, but in here in California, Joe, Democrats have a super majority. Why do we need ballot measures? <laughs> well, because of money in politics. Doesn't matter which political party is in power. As long as our political system is based on one dollar, one vote, the people who have the most dollars are gonna have the most number of votes in our political system. And that's just a cold reality. Until we get money out of politics and return ourselves to a place where it's one person, one vote, instead of one dollar, one vote, we're gonna have to take matters into our own hands through things like ballot initiatives. Yeah, my favorite line is from a local progressive candidate, Eric Olson, who said, Look, we have super majority. We're not negotiating with the Republicans. We're negotiating with our own donors. Yeah, and, that's right. And that's exactly right. Uh, but uh, you're actually putting money into politics to get uh, help to the average American worker, which is very rare. Uh, and so it's interesting that even in California, you're having to fight Democratic officials. But if they see it as a ballot measure and they see it's a, it, that it has a very good chance of passing, might they pass it in the legislature anyway? It's possible, but our ballot initiative isn't just about raising the minimum wage to 18 bucks. It's also about encoding to law an automatic cost of living adjustment. We've seen over the last decade, the things we have to buy go up in price, but our wages stagnate. And then we fight for these increases in the minimum wage, but every year as things become more expensive, the purchasing power of our dollar declines. And so what's unique about the initiative that we're putting on the ballot is that it encodes into law an automatic cost of living adjustment. So once the minimum wage reaches $18 in California, it'll then go up every single year at the rate of um, the increase of cost of living. So if the legislature and the governor were willing to pass into law an $18 minimum wage with the cost of living adjustment built into it, that'd be great. You know, then I can spend more time with my mom watching sports and, <laughs> and doing other things. Um, if they don't do that, though, we're going to do what needs to be done to ensure that it's on the ballot in November of 22 so that Californians can pass it into law themselves. We really have to fix the overall system here. I mean, this is absurd that you rely on people like Joe to come in and out of the goodness of their heart, try to push everybody's wages up when the entire system is working against it because of the obvious corruption of campaign contributions and especially from dark money and corporate PACs, etc. And of course, corporations want lower wages. They're not gonna pay politicians to have higher wages. There's something fundamentally wrong with the system. But Joe, I think that some skeptical people might look at this and go, yeah, but Joe, why are you really doing it? <laughs> right? So what's pushing you, what's motivating you to actually Spend again. I, I keep saying it because it's a considerable sum of money to get a ballot measure on the ballots, uh, and you're not getting anything out of it. Your company's already at 25 anyway, right? So, 
Um, so why? What better way to spend money than to help others? It, look, I agree with that, uh, but but not a lot of your uh, fellow wealthy folks in America do. You know, Joe, I maintain that greed is dumb uh, because it it doesn't give you much joy, uh, and and the extra money barely gives you any lift in happiness. I would imagine, but I'm not that wealthy. Uh, so, what's your experience with that? Like, it to me, it it seems like they're being inefficient. Like, how could another couple of million dollars help any more when you're already extremely wealthy? But again, I don't have that experience. So, what's your sense of it? Well, for me, this is personal. I've seen financial turmoil up close. My mom raised me by herself, and we faced a lot of financial uncertainty when I was a kid. We lost our home to foreclosure when I was a teenager. And in my mom, I saw a single mom who worked as hard as a mom can work. And even though she worked hard and played by the rules, things didn't work out for her financially. And as a kid, I think that that really pierced this idea that we're taught that we realize is a fantasy, a mythology, that if you work hard in America and play by the rules, you'll be able to be okay. My mom worked hard and she played by the rules and we lost our home to foreclosure. And the experience I, I had doesn't make me special, it puts me in solidarity with so many tens of millions of other people who've had the exact same experience. And so knowing this up close and personal is what motivates me to try and do everything I can to help others and prevent other families from experiencing what my family experienced. And then, you know, to wrap a bow around it, Jenk, I think that I'm optimistic because, well, there are a lot of hard problems in society that we don't know how to solve, diseases that we don't yet know how to cure. Poverty is actually really easy to solve. We know exactly how to solve poverty. We've just lacked the political will to do so. And if I can contribute to that political will during my life, what a great what a great contribution to make. Yeah, absolutely. Look, my dad got a free college education. Otherwise, I'd still be an olive farmer. And so it's personal for me because it it rescued my family and. A free college education actually doesn't cost that much overall in the scope of the of the budget of the United States of America. And I want to give people the same opportunity my dad had and we had. And so hearing your story about your mom, it makes perfect sense. You want to give people like your mom a fair chance. And I can't imagine a better way to spend money. And I wish other people realized the same thing you did. It might be a little bit better country. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun. But you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.